Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh annual CARI conference. And this year we're focusing uh, really for the first time, not only on Africa, but our conference is, on, our virtual conference is on China's overseas lending in comparative perspective. And as we did with our last conference, uh, this conference will be held over the next seven weeks. Every Tuesday morning from nine to 1030, we will have panels or keynote speeches. And um, we'll, it, the last time it went really well, this kind of format enables us to welcome people from all around the world more easily. I'd like to say a few things before we start. One is that last week, if you missed our event, our, our launch of our 2019 loan data together with Boston University, who's now going to be hosting the loan data and carrying our work forward, uh, we have all of the links to that event, to the recording and so on, on our website. And uh, the so for the next seven weeks, we'll be doing, again, continuing our focus on Chinese loans. And uh, I'd like to thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York, without uh, whose funding we wouldn't be able to do any of our work, so that we're really very grateful for that. And I'd also like to thank Marie Foster, our coordinator, who is behind the scenes work and the tireless effort makes, again, all of our work possible. And Yoon Jung Park, our associate director, our editor, Danielle Solana Ward, Hope uh, Marshall, who's our comms uh, person, who will probably be tweeting along with Marie during this conference. Um, and so it's now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today, Vikram Nehru. Vikram is a distinguished practitioner in residence at Johns Hopkins University, SICE. And he has a storied career. You can read about it on the, in the chat. And we will have links to all of the bios up in the chat. And for our conference, I'd like to note in particular that Vikram served as the director of the debt department at the World Bank, and he played a key role in shaping the HIPAA process. And so I think uh, that's, that process is in our minds as we look at the debt problems that countries are facing today in the developing world. So Vikram, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Deborah, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to this first session, which is uh, Lenders and Borrowers in Distress. Uh, we have three presenters and one um, discussant. I will introduce each one of them uh, uh, when their time is due. So the first presenter is going to be Deborah Bradigam herself. Uh, Professor Bradigam is the director of the China Africa Research Initiative, or CARI, which is the host of this conference and the Bernard L. Schwartz Professor of International Political Economy at Johns Hopkins SICE. So Deborah, the floor is yours. All presenters will have 15 minutes to give their presentations and then our discussant will have 10 minutes uh, to provide comments. So Deborah, over to you. Thank you, Vikram. I'm gonna share my screen. So um, my paper is called Zambia's Chinese Tragedy of the Commons. And um, it, it came about because I was looking at, um, at, at Zambia's situation and Zambia's borrowing from China. And it presented a number of puzzles. But um, let me just uh, run through some of that. Zambia, um, as we know now, is uh, facing, um, facing debt distress. Um, but Zambia is not been face, not facing this for the first time. Zambia asked the Paris Club, an informal cartel of official bilateral creditors for debt relief in 1983. Zambia knocked on the door of the Paris Club again in 1984 and in 1986 and in 1990, 1992, 1996, 2002 and 2005. And 15 years later, Zambia is again in debt distress. And this time Zambia's primary creditors are no longer meeting in Paris, but in Beijing, London and New York. So the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated Zambia's problems, but even before the pandemic, Zambia was heading for trouble. Then in November 2020, Zambia became the first country in the pandemic era to default on its sovereign bonds. And on February 5th this year, Zambia joined Ethiopia and Chad to seek deeper debt restructuring under the newly formed G20 Paris Club Common Framework. So as you can see here from this data, 
um, which is from the World Bank's international debt statistics, Chinese lending in Africa has become a, a larger and larger component. The blue, the turquoise here represents bilateral lending without China. And so we can see where the debt crisis um, happened from 1990 to 2005, uh, that turquoise area was quite large. And then the debt relief that happened during the, um, the HIPAC process and the earlier Paris Club processes uh, dropped that bilateral. It still remains. Um, but China comes in around 2005 in red and becomes a larger and larger slice of this. Still smaller than the World Bank, which is in green here, and smaller across Africa than purple, which is the international bonds. But Zambia presents a number of puzzles. Uh, for example, um, the data that we have at the China Africa Research Initiative on Chinese loan commitments is far higher than the Zambian government's public data on outstanding debt to Chinese entities. And many have speculated that Zambia is not reporting all that it owes to China. Of course, Zambia uh, counters us by saying that it's only reporting what's actually been dispersed. And so that may actually be more accurate. But let's look here at what they've been reporting to the World Bank. So this is um, data on debt, external debt to GDP uh, along the y-axis, and then debt to all of China as that's Chinese bilateral uh, official and non-official creditors as percent of total external debt. So we can see here that the countries in red are the ones that are currently in debt distress, and in orange, um, currently in high at high risk of debt distress. So the, um, the, the most of the countries that are borrowing from China. Um, their debt is down below 20% of, of external debt, but the, Cong uh, the Republic of Congo, Djibouti, Angola, and Zambia are some that stand out there. So, uh, but when we looked at, the, at our data on Chinese loan commitments and we graphed it the same way, so that commitments are down at the, in the x-axis and the external debt, all of uh, debt to GDP in the y-axis, Zambia stood out even further. So Angola's out to the far right, uh, but some of the loan commitments to Angola represent refinancing. And so Zambia and the Republic of Congo are really out there as anomalies. Um, so uh, Zambia has also been at the center of a remarkable number of rumors about Chinese lending and potential asset seizures, seizures ranging from the State Electricity Corporation to the International Airport to various mines. So what's really going on with Chinese lending in Zambia and what explains this Zambian exceptionalism? So as we can see here, um, these are Chinese annual loan commitments in Africa, excluding Angola. So um, they peaked in 2013. And, uh, and then they've been pretty much flat or even declining since then. And, as, um, and this pretty much follows along with uh, the growth rates in Africa. So as we can see here, um, the growth rates in green um, around 2013, 2014, they're still high and then they drop. Uh, significantly as oil prices and other commodity prices dropped. And we've um, tracked on here copper prices. So we can see they're also declining during that period. And there's a little bit of an upward tick from 2016, um, uh, but there's there's not really, it's, it's a puzzle in terms of the timing as I'll show you in this next slide. So as lending was going down in the rest of Africa from 2013 onward, it, booms up in Zambia. So 2016 and 2017 are the highest numbers uh, for Chinese loans in Zambia. So this is counter to what's going on in the rest of the continent. So one possible explanation for Zambia's troubles is offered by Ching Huan Li in her seminal study of Chinese capital in Zambia. Um, the specter of global China. Li argues that the absence of elite um, political will and a state developmental strategy in Zambia has made Chinese lending a perilous proposition. Chinese contractors and creditors, she argued, engage in rampant rent seeking, giving favors to politicians who throw aside prudent debt limits and approve overpriced contracts without competitive bid bidding. Li's analysis is persuasive in its details, yet the conditions she described are not at all unique to Zambia. Few governments in the continent stand out for their elite political will or their coherent development strategies. And the same Chinese banks and companies are, are active across the continent. And Zambia still stands out as problematic. Well, another line of analysis asks, is Zambia in control of strategic assets that might be particularly attractive to Chinese stakeholders? 
Analysts have accused China of practicing debt trap diplomacy regarding strategically located port projects in Sri Lanka and Djibouti, alleging that Chinese banks deliberately ensnared borrowers in unsustainable borrowing with the intention of leveraging this debt to seize assets. Although the story has been debunked with regard to Sri Lanka and remains conjecture in Djibouti, might it be playing out in Zambia? Um, and, and indeed, we've heard things like that, that Zambia's troubled state electricity company, Zesco, is, is already in talks about a takeover by Chinese company. And this uh, rumor was uh, circulated not uh, only by the media, but by the Trump administration's national security advisor, John Bolton. These allegations have also played out with regard to uh, Zambia's mines, perhaps being used as collateral for Chinese loans. But Chinese companies have had ample opportunity to invest in Zambia's electricity sector as independent power producers. And so far they've declined those opportunities. And they've been investing freely in mining since purchasing the derelict Chambishi mine in 1998. So it seems unlikely that there was a conspiracy to draw Zambia into debt in order to acquire these assets. So my argument has three parts. I argue that Zambia is an extreme case of two collective action problems, moral hazard and the tragedy of the commons. These two problems have arisen for historically contingent reasons as I outlined below. Um, so moral hazard, as we know, is when an actor behaves in riskier fashion because they believe that they're going to be bailed out based on past experiences. And as noted earlier, Zambia has been one of the Paris Club's most frequent visitors. And second, Zambia represents the tragedy of the commons. This collective action problem arises when individual incentives lead actors to overuse an un unregulated resource. So the common thing is uh, shepherds on a common grazing area or fishermen in a pond. And it arises when there are no effective rules imposed from above or below to allocate this resource sustainably. So I'll explain what I mean in a moment there. Um, and the third part of my argument is contingent. Um, and here it's based on history, and uh, which is why I put up a slide of Tazara here. So Zambia's frequent trips to the Paris Club and current debt distress underscore the point that debt management has been a challenge for most of Zambia's independent history. Every time Zambia has been teetering on the edge of the cliff, they've always been bailed out, as one informed observer told me. There's always a feeling that someone will come. On paper, Zambia's debt management rules are not far from best practice. The Minister of Finance is the only entity empowered to contract debt, and the government is supposed to seek parliamentary approval of loans and loan guarantees. Yet this is honored in the breach uh, more often than in practice. So ministries in Zambia, uh, as, a, as a 2016 report said, they make their own financing arrangements and then they use the clout of the head of state to force the finance ministry to authorize their frequently questionable credit arrangements. And slow disbursement is one consequence of a government borrowing beyond its absorptive capacity. According to an IMF study in April 2019, the total amount of contracted but undisbursed debt in Zambia was at 9.7 billion, around 40% of their 2018 GDP. And our analysis of project status for Chinese borrowing suggests that only 40% of Chinese funded projects signed since 2010 have been completed. In 2017 alone, Zambia had to pay 46 contractors who claimed penalty charges due to late payments by Zambia. So Zambia has been borrowing from China for a long time, since 1967. And it's not only the Tazara Railway in the picture that you see here, uh, but other projects, including two uh, very large roads that we'll see in a minute. Um, but uh, between 1990 and 2000, this lending was fairly modest with interest-free loans, predominantly for Tazara and spare parts, but between 2000 and 2010, this was gradually supplemented by more loans for telecom, stadium construction, hydropower, aircraft for Zambian Airways, helicopters, and so on. In this first 10 years of the millennium, the average project size was 68 million. Um, the Paris Club began writing down debt in countries like Zambia in 1988, and um, and during this time, as we saw, Zambia was one of the most frequent visitors to the Paris Club. But China also started um, a program, a parallel program of debt cancellation. And we, in a previous study, uh, collected all the information that we could find about debt cancellations. And we found that actually uh, Zambia 
turned out to be the country that had the highest amount of debt that had been canceled by China between 2000 and 2019. And it was also the most frequent visitor to Beijing in terms of debt cancellation. So there were six different um, episodes of debt cancellation, which was higher than any other country in our data. So um, over the next, over the uh, 19 years of this millennium, uh, we believe that, that uh, Zambia has signed about $10 billion in loan commitments. And this has gone to a number of different sectors, predominantly infrastructure. And the top four sectors are, are um, electricity, road transport, water, and uh, communications and infrastructure. But Zambia is also an anomaly in having 19% of the Chinese loans go into the defense sector. And so this compares our data with the World Bank's data. Uh, or excuse me, with Zambia's official data at, at the end of 2019. So their data is debt stocks and our data is uh, creditors' commitments. So just to compare Exim Bank, for example, uh, the Zambian government reports 2.6 billion in debt stocks and we report 4.6 billion in creditor commitments. Um, and then it goes down the line so that our commitments are higher than their debt stocks. And some of this will be because of disbursement issues. It's been slow to disperse and others because it's already been repaid. But Zambia is also unusual because uh, some of these have been, these loans have been given directly to state-owned enterprises. But again, when we look at the data, um, there are some interesting features of Chinese lending. Um, and, uh, and I'll talk about two of them right now because I think they also help explain what's going on there. So Chinese lenders, um, as, as we've seen, they facilitated Zambia's borrowing even when it appeared obvious that Zambia's budget was wearing thin. And one of the ways in which this happens is advanced payment funding. Um, export credits normally require the government to fund, uh, to provide an advance payment of 15% of the project costs. And Zambia has on many occasions not been able to come up with these funds. And so we've seen uh, sometimes the contractor provides the extra 15% as a bridge loan. Sometimes another Chinese bank has stepped in to provide that 15%. And Zambian analyst Trevor Sumumba noted this practice and called it borrowing upon borrowing. So it's a clear indication that there's a problem, uh, but the banks are facilitating that rather than, than, um, than stopping the lending. And there's another thing that stood out in our data, which was unique to Zambia. Zambia had the largest number of Chinese, different Chinese lenders operating in the country. So our data shows that Zambia has taken out loans from 15 different Chinese creditors. These include banks and corporations. And this is 50% higher than the next highest country in our data, which is Angola. And Zambia also comes in second. Uh, we now have contractor data in our loan data. We look at the contractors uh, that are carrying out all the projects. And Zambia was the number two country in terms of the number of contractors. Um, and that was second only to Angola. So Angola had the most, but Zambia had the second. And so uh, there, the Zambian government is failing to impose order on the signing of loans and no Chinese entity is responsible for reviewing the overall debt sustainability in Zambia and coordinating Chinese uh, lending decisions. So why are there so many Chinese lenders in Zambia? I believe this has to do with historical contingency. As we noted, Zambia hosted uh, China's largest aid project in Africa, the Tazara Rail Railway and several, several other significant projects. Um, in the 70s and 80s, and many contractors stayed on in, or returned to Zambia. In 1998, China's Statistical Almanac reported that Zambia already ranked third in Africa, with Chinese companies reporting 120 million in the value of projects contracted to Chinese companies that year. And we can see that Zambia has also stood out um, as a place where Chinese companies have repeatedly turned for their first African business investments. Zambia was the first country to host an overseas office for a Chinese bank, for example. And that goes all the way back to 1997 when the Bank of China established a Lusaka branch. It's the first place where Chinese um, investors have invested in a non-ferrous mine and the first place in Africa to have a Chinese agricultural investment. So why was this happening? Well, on the Zambia side, it's clear that the incentive to keep borrowing from China uh, is, is strong. But, um, but on the Chinese side, um, it, it really does seem as though there are um, a number of different actors 
and they're all competing and they're competing vociferously. And in the paper, I tell the story of one huge project, the Caffel Gorge project, which was um, bid out in 2015. And it went to the highest bidder, Sino Hydro. And uh, in the course of this, two other Chinese companies sued um, Zesco, the, the, the issuer of the contract for uh, irregularities in the tendering procedure. So I'll conclude um, by, by saying that Zambia was uh, unsurprisingly very quick to join the common framework. And the chances are good that Zambia will ultimately receive write downs on its unsustainable debt, just as it has done in the past. The experience of Zambia may be what pushes Beijing to institute better co coordination of overseas lending from the center, or even to develop its own Beijing club to allocate the costs of this debt restructuring to come amongst the various lenders and perhaps even amongst the construction companies that profited from this subprime lending. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bradigan. That was a, a terrific uh, presentation. I mean, I, I listening to you, um, I can't help but recall my time as the director of the debt department of the World Bank, when we introduced the debt sustainability framework. And one of my, and, and one of the, uh, requirements in the debt sustainability framework was that countries in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress should receive grants from official creditors um, rather than piling on new debt. And one of my remits was to go to China to try and convince the Chinese to do this, but they kept telling me that China's lending was different from the rest of the world. And I think what you have just shown is that that's not quite the case. Um, well, thank you very much for that. Our next speaker is uh, Yunnan Chen, who is a senior research officer in the Development and Public Finance Program at ODI. She's also a PhD candidate at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, uh, where I also teach. So welcome, Yunnan. Uh, her topic is going to be rail politic, Chinese development finance in Ethiopia's railway ambitions. I love the title and I'm looking forward to the presentation. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nehru. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and, and I should also thank uh, to Deborah and the Kari team for, for having me here today. So let me, I hope this works. Okay, great. Um, so my presentation today is going to draw on some earlier research that I did uh, that was funded by Kari, which looked at the, the sort of developmental impact of Chinese railway finance. Um, this is nicely illustrated by the two photos of stage, which show before and after um, in Ethiopia's railways. Uh, but today I want to focus a little bit on the significance of Chinese lending in Ethiopia's current debt distress and the contribution of these railway projects to, to some of these debt challenges. And from this, I'm going to draw some, some insights on, on China's approach as a creditor and some wider implications for China's overseas project finance. So even prior to COVID, uh, Ethiopia faced some quite severe external debt issues. Uh, its external borrowing you know, after, after the HIPAA initiative really took off in the mid 2000s. And a lot of this has gone towards uh, massive infrastructure investment, but it's been suffering from some, some uh, chronic foreign exchange shortages in that time, which has really hampered its ability to, to pay back its debts in hard currency. It was rated at high risk for debt distress by the IMF, and then in 2020, it also applied for the G20 DSSI, which allowed it to suspend debt repayments to official creditors, and most recently, it's been one of the, the three countries to apply for the G20 a common framework for debt restructuring. And this has prompted a, a downgrading of its, of its default rating by Fitch in 2021 and by Standard & Poor. Um, so how did we get here? How did Ethiopia uh, build up this, this debt? So like Zambia, Ethiopia has, has also been borrowing from diverse sources, uh, but whilst it also raised euro bonds, and this is a much smaller part of the story, um, most of Ethiopia's debt, as you can see, is, is really owed to multilaterals. However, uh, there's also a significant bilateral portion that is, a, that is owed to non-Paris Club uh, creditors. And, and as you can imagine, a, a large part of that is, is really China. China is a huge part of this story. 
Um, when we break down this lending by sector, you really see uh, this has gone towards huge uh, infrastructure investments. Um, but you really see how much of this, uh, a, a huge proportion is in specifically in the highway and railway transport sector, 23.7% uh, of external debt comes from that. And naturally, uh, a lot of this debt story centers around the, the Addis Djibouti Railway, which started operating in 2018. Um, this railway has been a long project in the making, even before China came along. Uh, in the 2000s, it was under the, the visionary former Premier Mela Zanawi, where railway was, was, was considered a, a priority component in Ethiopia's uh, wider um, strategy of development, its uh, strategy of economic transformation. Railway was also seen as an instrument of national political cohesion. And this development strategy really borrowed very heavily from, from Chinese experience, this idea of uh, export-led development through industrialization and manufacturing zones, as we see here, and that all of that's all by uh, massive infrastructure investment to, to facilitate these exports. So in 2007, the government created the Ethiopian Railway Corporation, or the ERC, that would oversee the construction of a new planned railway network spanning 5,000 kilometers in total. Uh, the Addis Djibouti line, which would be the, the priority line given the port connection to Djibouti, this was selected as the first railway line for construction. Um, there was also the, the bones of an old uh, French-built Chemin de Fer railway from, from a century ago. Uh, and after this, the Awash to Mekele line in the north was, was also selected for, uh, as a sort of second priority for construction. And the Awash to Eldia segment of this uh, was, was subsequently contracted and constructed by a Turkish firm, which I'll get to in a bit. And all of this is uh, came from incidental time of uh, massive Chinese overseas investment uh, in the early 2010s, where between 2011 and 2015, we saw huge uh, loans going towards massive standard gauge railway projects in Africa and in other parts of the world. The railway in this time was designated as a strategic sector for China's overseas investment. And in some cases, such as in Kenya, you know, some of these projects were also kind of incepted and brokered by the SOE contractors themselves and are also facing uh, problems now in their operations and repayment. Um, so I wanted to give you a quick timeline of, of the development of, of some of these railway projects, both the, the Chinese built and also the, the Turkish built. They, you can see that they're happening pretty much simultaneously, although so far only the Addis Djibouti line is operational. But most of the, two, the 2000s, this, this financing for these projects did not come easily. And Ethiopia was in the process of negotiating with numerous financiers, including the, the French Development Agency and the European Commission, uh, who were unable to, to provide the finance necessary. And in the end, it came to, uh, to China. Um, the contracts were won by Chinese contractors, and China Exim Bank agreed to finance for a new standard gauge railway, a new light rail, Addis, uh, a new light rail system for Addis Ababa. And also in this period, China Exim Bank financed a, a raft of other infrastructure projects, including transmission lines for the Grand Renaissance Dam, wind farms, expressways. In this time, Ethiopia went through also a lot of uh, domestic changes. We, we see three different prime ministers in this period. Uh, from, from 2015 onwards, you know, deepening civil unrest in the Oromo region and a state of emergency, which wasn't lifted until 2018 under the current Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed. Looking at the, the comparison between these two railways, uh, you know, this, this other railway under construction at this time was not Chinese finance, but it was a similar kind of EPC arrangement. And this second line from Awash Tawadiya was awarded to a Turkish company, Yap Merkezi who are also instrumental in brokering finance from a Turkish Exim Bank and a consortium of other European finances, including Credit Suisse. Um, both of these projects are on commercial terms, although you know, it's quite competitive with each other. Um, but compared to 
the other one, can X and banks advantage is, is really significant in terms of the scale of finance is able to provide. And a secondary advantage has been in the repayment phase as I've discussed. Um, since its completion, the Addis Djibouti Railway has faced a, a number of challenges, which you, some of you may be aware of. Um, it's it's side commission in 2018, but has been consistently operating at a loss since then. Some of these issues are technical. It's faced uh, multiple complications around the electrification of the railway, which also delayed commission. Uptake of the railway has also been quite low, uh, in part due to weak connections to the industrial zones uh, and also political economy reasons because um, of the monopoly over the trucking industry that's held by the uh, Ethiopian uh, shipping and logistics company. Um, and also in the eastern region uh, between Deredoa and the border in the RMR and Afar regions, the railway has also experienced um, a lot of local resistance and, and it's been a site of protest. Uh, small issues such as animals being tied to the tracks uh, for compensation reasons, as well as blockades of the railway on a regular basis. I think I should note that this railway was never meant to be financially profitable in itself. It was meant to play a catalytic role. It was meant to stimulate manufacturing investment and exports from these industrial zones and generate much needed foreign exchange that way. But as yet, it's not, uh, it's really been struggling to, to meet these objectives. And prior to COVID, uh, Ethiopia, as I said, And for these railway loans, despite that they were not generating revenue. But we see very different approaches between creditors. So, even though they continue to pay a bit of credit for the project, I am inferring repayments for the Chinese railway loan as well as management fees to the Chinese contractors that were going to operate the project. And this approach of loan deferral is quite common for, for Chinese creditors as research from Kari and Rhodium Group and others have shown, it seems to be a default. Uh, however, Ethiopia was then subsequently able to renegotiate a restructure to these loan terms. And this came from the highest level. There were discussions underway through 2018, but the agreement really came in the aftermath of a meeting between Prime Minister Abiy and President Xi at the 2018 Bokak Summit in Beijing. Uh, and what this amounted to was a rescheduling of the railway loan, um, an extension of the repayment period from 10 years to, uh, to an additional 20 years. So we have uh, a 30 year repayment period, which is a significant concession and loss in the loan net present value. And so why did China agree to this? Um, I think what this case illustrates is just how important that political and strategic relationship is. Uh, the, the strategic partnership that Ethiopia enjoyed with China and the very politicized nature of the project, the fact it was enfolded into the Belt and Road Initiative as well, made it extremely politically salient. And we see this in the fact that the Chinese SOEs that are operating the line uh, are doing so despite the fact that they are still owed several years worth of unpaid fees from the ERC who haven't been able to front these costs in hard currency. So the Chinese SOEs are paying for the railway operations, maintenance and capacity building largely through their own financing. I think this is also a case where given China's other investments in Ethiopia, in, in special economic zones, uh, in manufacturing and real estate, all of these other um, areas of investment are also overlapping and tied to the success of the railway. In a sense, it's become a project that's too big to fail. And given the, the pressures of Ethiopia's foreign exchange crisis, I think creditors uh, decided to cut their losses. This story is not one of uh, China versus bondholders, as we saw in Zambia last year, but I think it's an interesting context and prelude to that, to that standoff that we've seen in the previous year. Um, there's been a lot of resistance around debt restructuring and, and you know, fears from the Chinese side that any debt relief that China offers would go towards paying the private sector. And this fear is not unjustified because uh, as we see in the Ethiopian case, that's exactly what's been happening. And so in this sense, 
China does benefit from Ethiopia joining the common framework. It's, it's a way that does ensure some kind of parity for Chinese lenders vis-a-vis uh, -vis private sector creditors. The Addis Djibouti case is also interesting as uh, a, a critical juncture within China's overseas lending trends. Uh, as we saw already, lending really slowed down after 2014, and then there's a real deceleration after 2017 within the system. Um, the case is, is interesting because it illustrates also the role of Sinoshore within this, this lending architecture. So as the state credit insurer, Sinoshore was the one who absorbed the losses from, the wrong, from non repayment of the loan. And reportedly from the Addis Djibouti restructure, Sinoshore lost around 1 billion US dollars. And there was an uncharacteristically public admonition from Sinoshore extremely vocally critical of the project quality and the lack of due diligence. And this, I think, uh, reflects a, a wider recognition of, of a moral hazard problem in China's overseas lending, where we have contractors who have an incentive to generate these project contracts. The banks have an incentive to lend, particularly when the project is uh, politically salient. And they're safe to do so if they have a, a guarantee from Sinoshore. But Sinoshore is the one who ends up having to eat the losses from this. And after this project, uh, Sinoshore has refused any further guarantees to Ethiopia. Um, just to wrap up, a huge part of the external debt that we've seen in Ethiopia's uh, current debt challenges does come from Chinese sources. But in the case of the largest loans uh, that, that have come from the railway sector, uh, we also see that China has been you know, the most flexible and, and collaborative, if you can say, lender. Uh, and while Ethiopia was able through the DSSI to suspend debt service to its major bilateral creditors, this wasn't really a game changer for, for its relations with China because with, with Chinese creditors, it had already been suspending debt repayments for several years beforehand. Uh, the case is also interesting, I think, as a watershed moment in the evolution of, of China's outward uh, financial architecture. We've really seen a marked slowdown in financing in 2019 reflected in both data sets from, from Kari and Boston University. And this, I think, reflects some internal reforms and restructures within the official policy banks and, and wider policy signals are putting greater emphasis on uh, the, the importance of quality in overseas projects. There's a recognition that due diligence and, and the financial feasibility does matter. Uh, in the meantime, I think we're unlikely to see any further financing in Ethiopia's rail sector, um, particularly after the, the recent uh, Tigrayan conflict has made the, the perception of the country even more high risk. Um, but if we were to end on a positive note, you know, despite the challenges that the, this railway project has faced and despite the pandemic in the last year, uh, the project operations are actually continuing and expanding. And if there's a light at the end of the tunnel, it's that the, the Addis Djibouti Railway is, is supposedly going to break even later this year. But the future success of this project and the catalytic role that it's meant to play is, is really dependent on, on uh, the wider structural factors in the country, on uh, the continued political and uh, economic stability um, of the country. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Yunan. Uh, and so glad that you ended on a positive note. Um, uh, you know, one of the interesting conclusions from your uh, presentation was that China was being a flexible and collaborative lender. But of course, that does mean that many of these costs and losses are being transferred back to the Chinese financial system, uh, which is already suffering under some strain. So it'll be interesting to see what happens on that side of the equation. So thank you very much for that. Our next speaker is Erica Downs. Uh, Erica is a, a senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. So welcome, Erica. Her uh, presentation is going to be on the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Power Sector Projects, Insights into China's Lending. So over to you, Erica.
Um, thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to be speaking about China's involvement in Pakistan's power sector uh, based on a report that the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia published in 2019. And I'd like to start by saying a few words about why the CPEC power sector projects are worth looking at to gain insight into Chinese financing for overseas projects. Slide, please. And there are two main reasons. One is that the CPEC power sector projects are a big part of CPEC. Uh, that at the end of 2018, power projects accounted for 13 out of 22 CPEC projects uh, that had been completed or were under construction. And if we fast forward to today, the CPEC power projects account for two thirds of the cost of CPEC projects initiated or completed or 22 out of $33 billion. Another reason to study the CPEC power sector projects has to do with the availability of information about how the projects are financed, especially from documents that are available on the website of Pakistan's National Electric Power Regulatory Authority, or NEPRA, uh, that you can go online and you can find uh, documents related to generation licenses, um, and tariff applications and negotiations. Uh, and these were a very useful set of information for me. Um, they did not contain all the data I would have liked to see, but there was certainly enough information there to gain an understanding about how these projects were being financed. Um, and this came not just from numbers, but from um, you know, narratives of negotiations between the parties that, that NEPRA put in some of their reports. Slide, please. And so today I'm going to address three questions. Now, the first one is why is the China-Pakistan economic corridor dominated by coal power plants? Second question is uh, how are the CPEC coal power plants financed? And then the third question is, what do these projects tell us about debt trap diplomacy, uh, which was a very big issue at the time I was doing my research and writing. Slide, please. And so I'll be making three main points. Uh, the first one is that um, the dominance of coal-fired power plants in CPEC is the result of both a pull from Pakistan and a push from China. Uh, the second point is that the CPEC power plants are primarily financed with loans from Chinese banks to project, Chinese project companies. Um, and the third point is that while these projects uh, may increase and are increasing uh, Pakistan sovereign debt, uh, it's unlikely that they are part of a deliberate debt trap. And so when I talk about the uh, CPEC power sector projects, the ones that I look at in my report um, are what uh, the CPEC website describes as the energy priority projects or projects that initially were intended uh, to be completed by 2020. And there's a breakdown of the projects on the screen and you can see that seven out of the 15 are coal projects. And I should mention that some of these coal projects are two part projects and that they involve both developing a coal mine and building a power plant. And just to put this in perspective, if you add up uh, the capacity of all the energy priority uh, projects, you'll see that 74% of that capacity is from coal power plants. Slide, please. And before I get to talking about the, the pull from Pakistan and the push from China, um, I just wanted to show a picture of the tar desert in Pakistan. Uh, it contains one of the world's largest coal resources and it is connected to why Pakistan um, wants to have Chinese financing to help develop power sector projects, especially coal. Um, and with that, um, next slide, I'll turn to talking about the pull from Pakistan. 
Um, and for me, as someone who has looked primarily at Chinese overseas financing from the China perspective, it was really interesting to see a host country side of the story. Um, and so I do want to emphasize that this was not a case of China uh, trying to persuade Pakistan to buy coal power plants that it really didn't want. Um, in fact, it was quite the opposite that former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif actively sought financing from China uh, for the development of power sector projects, especially coal plants. And there are three main reasons for this. Um, the first one is that uh, when Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif was campaigning for re-election in 2013, uh, Pakistan had a lot of power shortages due in part, not solely, but in part to inadequate generation capacity. And uh, Sharif had campaigned uh, on a platform of keeping the lights on for longer. So one of his top priorities upon being reelected was to um, get more power plants constructed. And second, he wanted to build power plants that would run on coal. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that a large part of Pakistan's foreign exchange has been spent on importing fuel oil and natural gas to uh, fuel power plants. Um, and so uh, there was a view that if Pakistan's domestic resources, if their coal could be developed, that that would help the country conserve foreign exchange. Um, there was also a view, again, going back to when um, Sharif was reelected and the China-Pakistan um, economic quarter was being formulated. Um, at that time, there was a view that coal plants would be a cheaper source of electricity than alternatives, notably fuel oil. Um, however, today, um, it's worth pointing out that coal power plants are not necessarily um, generating more cheaper electricity than those from other energy sources, such as wind or solar, uh, the tariffs for which have gone down quite a bit in recent years. And finally, there was a perception in the government in Pakistan that in terms of bringing on as much new generation capacity as quickly as, poss as possible, that there really was no better option in the short term than coal. And NIPRA, for example, pointed out that hydro pro hydropower projects um, often have delays in uh, getting up and running and that there were concerns about the ability of Pakistan's grid to integrate variable sources of energy like wind and solar. Um, and finally, Pakistan offered financial incentives to companies to come in and develop power plants, especially in the coal sector. And many of these incentives, such as sovereign guarantees, high internal rates of return um, were not specific to China, but were available to anyone who wanted to come in and invest in the power sector. Slide, please. And uh, China was happy to meet this need for power plants, especially coal power plants. And there were a couple of reasons for this. Uh, the first one is that China produced more generator sets um, than it could install domestically. And so there was a clear preference for exporting those generation sets uh, rather, rather than uh, warehousing them. Um, it's also worth noting that a single overseas coal power plant can generate a lot of business for a lot of different firms. There's obviously the contractor, uh, there's the firm that's running it, there's the firm that's designing it, um, the banks that are funding it, uh, the law firms that are advising the banks and so on um, and so forth. And the Chinese government also offered financial support to companies um, for exporting um, power generation equipment. And finally, China was able to meet Pakistan's need for speed that um, when Prime Minister, uh, one of the reasons Prime Minister Sharif turned um, to China for financing is because he wanted to get pa new power plants up and running before he stood for re-election in 2018. Uh, basically, he wanted to make good on his promise uh, to keep the lights on for longer. And there was a lot of pressure put on the Chinese companies to meet this time frame. Um, and the head of uh, Power China, which is a company that is involved in running some of these power plants and building some of these power plants in Pakistan, actually said in an interview that you know, he had told his 
Pakistani um, interlocutors, you know, that there was no way that Power China could meet the schedule, the time frame that he wanted the plants built on, you know, that the average time for bringing one, one of these, getting one of these plants from uh, conception to operation, um, you know, was longer than the time frame that uh, Pakistan was looking at. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the government did end up meeting, sorry, at the end of the day, uh, Power China did end up getting these plants up and running uh, in time, but that was not enough to get um, Sharif reelected. Slide, please. And I also wanted to show um, a diagram of how uh, one of the CPEC coal power plants um, is financed. Most of the information um, on the slide came from documents uh, on the NEPRO website. Um, the red shows Chinese entities, the green shows Pakistani entities, and the blue Qatari. Um, and basically what this uh, slide shows is that the uh, Port Kasim uh, coal power plant uh, is financed both by debt and equity financing, 20, 75% debt, 25% equity. Um, as you can see, Power China and its joint venture partner, um, Almir Cobb Capital, uh, injected uh, their own capital into the project company. Um, and then the Import Export Bank of China uh, also uh, provided a loan to the project company. And then we have the government of Pakistan. Uh, both being the sole purchaser of power generated by this plant, um, as well as the provider of a sovereign guarantee for this plant. Slide, please. And this brings me to um, the issue of CPEC and debt sustainability. Uh, the conclusion that I reached in the paper is that the CPEC power plants um, do pose some sovereign debt risk to Pakistan, but it uh, seems unlikely that um, this is the result of an intentional uh, plan by China to uh, push Pakistan into debt distress. Um, and even though you have a Chinese borrower and a Chinese lender for a lot of these projects, um, there is a risk to Pakistan, both because it does provide the sovereign guarantee for the power purchase agreements, and it is the sole producer, sorry, sorry, the sole purchaser of power from uh, the CPEC coal power plants. Um, that said, uh, when I was looking at this issue of um, you know Chinese intentions, it seemed to me that um, it's it's unlikely that uh, that trapping Pakistan in debt. Uh, was um, the desired outcome for China. And there are a bunch of reasons for that that I run through in the paper, um, you know, and that it would undermine the bilateral relationship, um, you know, that it's in China's interest to have a more prosperous Pakistan, um, that uh, the a CPEC induced debt crisis would tarnish the image of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and, and so on and so forth. And so slide please. And so finally, um, just to wrap this all up, um, three of the main conclusions of my study are that the dominance of coal power plants in CPEC reflects both a strong pull from Pakistan and a push from China. Um, and this of course gets at the, the, the issue of borrowing country or host country agency. Uh, sometimes that doesn't as get, get quite as much attention as I think it should. And so um, I did wanna point this out um, that uh, in the case of, of the CPEC power sector projects that these were something that you know, were actively pursued by Pakistan and specifically the administration of former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Uh, second conclusion um, is that what I just said, that this the power plants highlight the importance of the host country um, in determining which projects are built uh, and the composition of its uh, power generation mix. Um, and finally, these power plants may increase Pakistan's sovereign debt, but um, the fact that uh, Sorry, that these projects may increase Pakistan's sovereign debt, but that a debt trap seems unlikely. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Erica. I must say we've had three outstanding uh, presentations. 
And we are now uh, very privileged to have uh, Professor Lemma Senbet um, to be the discussant. Uh, he is the William E. Mayer Chair Professor of Finance at the University of Maryland, College Park, and former founding director of the Center for Financial Policy. And uh, Professor Senbet, uh, you have uh, now 10 minutes to give your uh, uh, comments on the presentations. Over to you. Greetings, uh, everyone. I'm uh, sending you greetings from Washington, DC. I hope all of you are uh, keeping safe. Uh, real privilege uh, for me to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, Deborah and uh, um, your team. So um, I've been assigned to discuss three papers and uh, I, uh, I can have to admit that I don't normally discuss three papers at the same time. So it's going to be somewhat difficult. So I'm going to focus on the papers which are Africa related. The reason being that I originate uh, from, from Africa. But I, I must say that these three papers are very informative, a lot of information display, a world of experience and, and that, that the three individuals have in each of those three countries, Pakistan, uh, Ethiopia, and uh, uh, Zambia. I'm going to share a screen. So I'm going to begin with China and Africa. Uh, Chinese are everywhere in Africa. So they are in commodities, they are in retail, hotels, infrastructure, and China is the largest trading partner as an individual country. Uh, it has come uh, very close to the EU uh, in terms of uh, trading uh, volume, uh, but you know, lagging in terms of investments uh, behind the US, but also rising rapidly in that uh, arena as well. I think the biggest um, transformational partnership uh, between Africa and China is infrastructure. And that's what you saw uh, today. And the other uh, advantage of uh, China-Africa partnership is really the peer pressure, pressure that it has created. Peer pressure on EU, Brazil, Turkey, Israel, even the US woke, woke up and started enhancing its partnership with Africa as now embodied in what is known as uh, Prosper Africa. So uh, Zambia, uh, um, uh, Deborah has presented a wealth of information institutions, the very, uh, very interesting study. Uh, so it's been a frequent visitor to the Paris Club, eight times uh, over the years. And, and uh, but then there has been history, clear history of mismanagement of debt and finances in Zambia. Despite that fact, there has been repeated and overborrowing from a willing overlending partner called China. Uh, so what explains this anomaly? So we have two cases, the borrower is anomalous, the lender is anomalous. What explains that? So the paper uh, mentions um, two things at least. One is the whole area of explicit implicit, implicit guarantees. Based on history, uh, there is now a presumption that uh, the Zambians would expect uh, some kind of, uh, kind of flexible, uh, even rescued uh, treatment from the creditors. So that definitely creates uh, a ball hazard issue. And the other is uh, the tragedy of the commons, uh, the whole idea of uh, basically overfishing. You know, you go back and overuse unregulated resource. Uh, so the one thing I think Deborah needs to do more here is uh, as to why this is actually different from the other countries in Africa. I know that they try to do that, but I didn't really find it as compelling as it should 
maybe uh, with additional analysis, maybe even econometrics, uh, this is something to pursue because this is a very interesting anomalous case. And I think the explanations that we have now are more of a conceptual, but I think they need to be uh, a little bit more data driven and, and, and make it uh, more, more, uh, more compelling. Um, and there are, for other, there are also other reasons in our history, uh, the longest time in China Zambia relationship, and also the election cycle. Infrastructure usually you know, is kind of a showcase for, for, uh, for politicians. Um, so the analysis is really in, in the paper is uh, mostly pre-COVID. And then there also the corporate price instability was uh, shown up. I think uh, here, maybe for the Zambia paper, it may not be the purpose, this whole idea of corporate price instability. So one of the reasons is that the contracts are designed in a way that uh, the borrowers uh, get caught up in a situation where they are not able to pay. So there are now movements, movements, the resolution space towards doing, coming up with contracts which are tied to ability to pay. So for instance, targeting to the price uh, or, or GDP. So reforms and contingencies on ability to pay is something that uh, should be looked at uh, in terms of uh, that resolution, especially in the case of commodity rich countries like Zambia and others. Now, um, Chinese debt is very popular, we know that. And I think it came as a result of a changing debt landscape. Basically, there was an increasing shift from the private clubs creditors and then private creditors, syndicated bonds, euro bonds. Uh, to me, uh, there is a good news to this, right? So it really reflects the fact that um, African countries, for the first time, started accessing uh, credit markets at arm's length. Uh, this is, is not even accidental because it's also uh, coincidental with the Africa uh, growth re renaissance. And, and we know that that's not accidental either. It is actually based on years of economic and financial reforms. Well, the bad news is what we are facing now. So now size and then also composition and, and associated with that is high debt service costs and then we have diffused creditor base and restructuring challenges. So now the issue of private credit participation becoming a big issue in terms of debt resolution. So, 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 so there's a good news and the bad news. You know, the, here you want to maximize the good part and see if you can actually minimize uh, the bad part. And that has not been managed uh, well so far. Um, Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia's economic partnership with China is really deep. And um, uh, Yunnan did a very good job. Um, uh, by the way, I'm of Ethiopian origin. She knows much more about Ethiopia than I do <laughs> in this space. So the so Addis Djibouti Railway uh, is a signature uh, activity, part of the Chinese infrastructure uh, contribution to Africa. Uh, again, here, peer pressure is being used. So Turkey uh, became another partner, another lending partner for the other railway, Awash and Waldia Railway. Uh, so that has been, again, the infrastructure partnership that I mentioned, very useful. Again, it's like anything that is being done with China, there's always the bad and the good side. And then of course, this has immediate impact on debt burden and sustainability. Uh, and then in the case of peer pressure, it also gives us an opportunity to do comparative analysis, which which, uh, which none has done. Differences in terms of loan contract, size, duration, and then also competition. Uh, so the advantage is now diversity because you can mitigate risk, but the disadvantage is one of uh, not being able, able to have multiple system to be well integrated with, uh, with indigenous uh, systems. So um, on Pakistan, I don't really have much to say because I didn't really, uh, that's not my, there was, there was one thing that actually was kind of a striking to me, very broad, 
the whole idea of the energy mix uh, toward coal. And, and then uh, those, there, was, there was something uh, kind of uh, implicit in the paper that uh, um, China uh, could actually just go along with that. So, so, so I think this is one of the issues that we have also observed uh, in Africa with, with China, Africa economic partnerships, often there is uh, an issue of governance not being endogenized, you know, issue of environment, social protection, labor relations. So, so people are actually start wondering what is the impact of Chinese engagement and the quality of governance? Again, uh, here, uh, the, the energy mix towards coal, where, where many people are actually moving toward uh, clear, clean energy, is uh, attention on environment and, and governance. It's, that's all I'm going to say about Pakistan. I'm sorry, uh, Erica. Uh, let me then uh, conclude by um, be, by kind of moving this a little bit forward looking on that resolution. So when we start talking about resolving debt issues, one of the things that often comes up is capacity for domestic resource mobilization and sustainable finance. So one of the things that I noticed, I spent five years in Africa when I was leading ARC. One of the things that I noticed was that despite these generous arrangements, uh, sometimes concession with France, from China, from other partners, what it is doing is taking away incentives from many countries to get their house in order. And having house in order is means to me, means, means that they should put a lot of investment, a lot of investment in developing their financial sector, the source mobilization within the region. Now we have an incredible, incredible opportunity in this new, new trading agreement. Basically, the largest uh, trading agreement encompassing 55 countries, largest in terms of population, you know, 1.3 billion uh, population, um, and then well, close to 3 uh, trillion GDP. So, uh, so one of the things that I noticed is that unlike other trading agreements, the scope of this one is broader. It includes integration in services, including finance. So I think, I think one of the roles that China can play and also other creditors can play is start helping build capacity, capacity in terms of developing the financial sector. And that is also one way that could actually mitigate the debt issues moving forward. And also as, as these countries come together, uh, you know, there's also peer pressure in terms of monitoring at the continental level, maybe the political economy issues uh, that we have discussed in the context of Zambia and other countries could also, also uh, get, um, um, get um, uh, reduced. So it's one thing that people have, haven't really discussed much is the role of China in Africa integration. So COVID-19 has, has actually uh, awakened us to the imperative of the speeding of, of the integration of this continent through this incredible trading agreement that and China can actually play a big role. And Kapati issue also came up in uh, Yunnan's presentation with reference to Addis Djibouti Railway. So, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff if you don't have a record capacity in the area of finance, if you don't have talented financial manpower, if you don't have uh, good records, you cannot actually uh, do a good job in developing sectors. So that is an area that I think moving forward, China in a, in a mutually beneficial, productive way can actually partner uh, with regions such as Africa. I'm going to stop here. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Senrad. A very rich uh, set of comments for a very rich uh, set of uh, presentations. I was particularly struck by your question on the quality of governance and the impact of China on the quality of governance. Indeed, in our analysis, we show that the quality of governance is one of the best predictors of debt distress in the future. And so the impact on governance is terribly important. What I'd like to do, we now have about half an hour for Q&A, but I'd like to start with Professor Senbet's points and perhaps marry them with some of the questions that have come up uh, in the Q&A. Um, let's start with you, uh, Professor Braudigan. Uh, there was a very important question that uh, Professor Senbet raised. He asked the question, why is Zambia different? 
uh, it seems to be sort of seems to stand out amongst all the other African countries who are borrowing from uh, China. And I'd like to, uh, uh, while we have you on the screen, I'd like to also post you the question that has been raised by Martin Kessler. Martin asks, uh, he says, thanks a lot for this great presentation. He said, in the case of debt restructuring, he's talking, I presume, about uh, Zambia. How are these, how are different lending institutions going to be treated? Public ones under the common framework, private ones under a renegotiation with the Zambian government, uh, with the proviso that their terms are at least as good. And where there is a dispute, for example, about the China Development Bank, how would you be able to include all of these in, an, in, 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 in a debt restructuring agreement? So two different questions, but since we're talking about Zambia, I thought I'd pose it to you. Uh, thanks very much. And, and thank you, Lama, for those, uh, those great overview points that you made. Um, I, I do think there is something different about Zambia, which is why I've, I've been trying to figure out what the variables are. You know, how, how is Zambia different from the other countries in our data? And um, so it, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that the number of different lenders and the number of different uh, contractors is, is, stands out in Zambia. So I, I really think that is part of the, the uh, problem. Um, but it's also the moral hazard issues in Zambia are, are stronger, I think, than in other places, just in terms of the numbers of different times they've gotten uh, this repeated debt cancellation. Uh, but it's also that Zambia has been weaker in terms of getting its house in order, as, as you mentioned. That when you can see, for example, that the IMF representative, there's a different, uh, different uh, story telling of this story, but he was either withdrawn by the IMF or kicked out by the Zambians in 2018. And that's, that's very rare for that to happen in a country. And it's because he was warning the government that they're path was unsustainable and they didn't like hearing that. So Zambia is also, we noticed when we did our study on Chinese debt relief, Zambia in the recent era, they've been in debt crisis and they haven't gotten until very, very recently, they hadn't gotten any debt restructuring from the Chinese, despite a whole pattern of the Republic of, of Congo and, and Mozambique and Cameroon, Chad, Ethiopia, all of these countries had come to China and gotten reprofiling or restructuring of their debt. But that hasn't happened with Zambia. So that, that um, Zambia, because they haven't gotten their house in order enough even for the Chinese to provide uh, some kind of more, more lasting debt uh, relief for them. And so when you compare also, uh, there was a question I saw about why is Tanzania not going down the same path? Well, these are, are, are it's the governance in these two countries. So when, when you see, for example, Tanzania has only taken out 12 loans uh, from China since 2000, whereas Zambia has taken out 72. <laughs> so that's it's a very different pattern. And Nigeria, another place where Chinese construction companies have been working for a very long time, but Nigeria has good debt management and they've borrowed, uh, they've only taken out 19 loans and they've managed to keep it all under control. So um, <laughs> I think also that Zambia reflects um, badly on on China's view of debt sustainability analysis. So they have a different approach. They look at how projects can lead to future growth and that's true, but they don't all, uh, th that future growth can be, take some time to come. And in the meantime, Zambia can't pay for, for what it's invested in. So how will the different lending institutions be handled? Um, well, it's clear already, there has been one round of DSSI treatment in Zambia. And uh, China has been very clear, Beijing has been very clear and this is really where we need to disaggregate China. And, and our data just shows us so clearly that China Exim Bank is the one creditor out of all those 15 creditors in Zambia that's included, well, there are two. There's China, Develop, uh, China Export Import Bank and SIDCA, which is the foreign aid agency. Those two are included under the DSSI. And all those other creditors, all 13 of them are not included by Beijing. And most of them are, they are commercial creditors and, and nobody's including their commercial creditors. China Development Bank is debatable. Beijing's um, grouped them with other commercial banks just like, like the West or like Germany has grouped KFW IPEX as a commercial bank. So right now the, the common framework just, you know, it, it's just like the DSSI, it says, well, they should be, you know, we encourage them to be, but there's no enforcement or no 
no way to get the commercial creditors to also participate. So I think the jury is out on whether or not this common framework is going to work. China Exim Bank will, will probably be there, but I don't see any reason for the other Chinese creditors to join up when the bondholders have not provided any debt relief yet uh, to any of the DSSI countries uh, or have other commercial banks. Um, uh, and we've seen ICBC and CDB both providing reprofiling in uh, Angola and in Zambia so far. So I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah. Um, I mean, the questions, by the way, in the Q&A are coming in thick and fast. I'm not sure we'll be able to do justice to all of them, but I'll select a few uh, and I'll add perhaps my own questions to them. Uh, so this one is uh, to Yunnan. Um, so uh, this is from Calvin Ho, uh, you know, and there is talk that despite the fact that China loans are concessional, uh, costs are probably overstated so China can make up for its low interest rates. And for example, it takes the case of railways in, the Ken in, in Kenya, uh, uh, and they're apparently uh, much more costly than railways in other parts of the world. Is there any truth to that? And I guess the question that one should add to this is, in the example that you took in Ethiopia, were, was there international competitive bidding for these projects? Uh, or was this purely a bilateral deal without any analysis of alternative, uh, uh, alternative costs and sources of uh, competition? Thank you for the questions. Um, on, let me address the, the bidding question first. Uh, so, in the case of the Addis Djibouti Railway, uh, the plans had already been laid out long before Chinese contractors arrived on the scene. So uh, there was pretty much a ready-made project for them to, to bid on. They were not as involved in, in sort of doing the, uh, the, the pre-feasibility studies and that project inception. Um, when it comes to bidding, given that it was, uh, it was bilaterally agreed in terms of its financing, you know, that financing is naturally going to be tied to Chinese contractors. I do believe there was some, uh, an internal uh, competitive arrangement, let's say, between Chinese contractors for the project. Uh, and so CREC and CCECC, the two construction contractors, uh, they, they competed uh, for those two segments. Um, CREC had a natural advantage because they had already been involved in previous uh, light rail projects for that. In the Turkish case, that one was an open bid. Um, that one was uh, uh, open to, to all international um, bidders, including uh, Chinese contractors as well. And in that case, the Turkish company won because they had a low cost package and they were able to broker financing. They had the EPC plus uh, advantage of being able to pull in Turkish Exim Bank there. Um, on, on the costs of railways, uh, I, I should caveat that I am not a railway finance expert, and this is a very technical issue. So it's really hard to say, you know, how much railway should cost per kilometer. And I, I think there were some questions about you know, comparisons between the Kenyan and Ethiopian case. And there is some skepticism that the Kenyan railway cost more than the Ethiopian railway, despite being shorter in length and not electrified but it's a different terrain. There were more bridges and civil works involved in the construction that would have pushed the, the project cost up. Um, and also, you know, as events are coming to light, you know, there's, there's, there is a corruption factor as well. Um, when you have a contractor that, that arrived to that project that didn't uh, really bid on it, um, there is an incentive to inflate project costs on, on the part of these Chinese contractors as well. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll stop there for other questions. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, Erica, may I now uh, turn to you? Um, there's a question which I'm going to rephrase like slightly. It's from James Cook. And he's asked, he, he asked whether you can discuss the quality, I presume, of the Chinese financed uh, 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 um, coal powered projects uh, and their implications for pollution. And I want to add my own take on this. When you talked about the push and pull of uh, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan's coal power projects, uh, to what extent was the fact that under American leadership, there was a restriction, the part of all international multilateral development banks to lend for coal powered generation plants around the world? 
And this put a freeze on all new lending for coal fired projects and allowed then almost forced countries, and Pakistan was not alone in this, including Indonesia and others, to go to China for uh, uh, financing and, and, and technology. And a lot of the technology that was available was in fact for dirty, relatively dirty coal power projects relative to the latest technology available in the rest of the world. So to what extent is this gonna have sort of climate change and pollution consequences, uh, uh, which I noticed you didn't touch on in your presentation. Yeah, no, happy happy to, to talk about that. Um, and that is something that comes up in the paper, which also talks about environmental sustainability. Um, so I guess just to take the pollution issue first, um, one of the arguments that some of the Chinese um, sponsors of these coal projects made is that the, the coal plants we are building in Pakistan actually are cleaner or you know less polluting than the fuel oil plants that they are um, replacing. That one of the reasons that Pakistan wanted to have coal-fired plants built is because they have a lot of power plants that run on fuel oil, um, a lot of foreign exchanges spent on that. And so the argument has been made by the Chinese companies that, hey, our projects are cleaner, they're using state-of-the-art technology. Um, you know, and just in support of that argument, I think one of the things they point to is the an, a coal plant that is being uh, financed by the Asian Development Bank in Pakistan. I think it's the ADB's last coal-fired plant. And if you look at the project documents put out by the ADB, you know, they actually have some numbers where they sort of show um, how, you know, the extent to which the plant is less polluting, um, you know, both in terms of NOx and SOx, but um, also carbon dioxide. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's how um, it's been, you know, the Chinese have, have explained, um, you know, why these plants are, you know, sort of, you know, not as bad as they could be, that the coal-fired plant is less polluting than the fuel oil plant they're replacing. Um, but there are certainly, there have been some concerns if you look, um, you know, through discussions of these plants in uh, Pakistani media outlets that there have been concerns about pollution from um, plants, um, especially not just air pollution, but also water pollution. Thank you. Professor Senbed, if you ever want to jump in, by the way, please do jump in and uh, make a comment or whatever you wish. Uh, just, just let me know uh, when you want to intervene. Um, we have an excellent question for you, Professor okay, Bradley. Well, uh, yeah, go uh, ahead. Please, go ahead, Professor Senbed, go ahead. You're muted, you're muted. Yeah, the thing that was striking for me was the behavior of the Chinese on the environmental side, all right? Uh, basically, no strings attached. Um, and then, then it kind of brought back uh, what I observed in the Afghan context, where they do uh, engage in, in contracts and relationships and do not really quite endogenize governance. You know, especially the quality. I mean, that's that, that really, really related. So, um, uh, so that's where I was coming from. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Bradigan, a very interesting question from Juichi Inada. China is a leading lender in Zambia, especially the resource sector and in Ethiopia and the transportation sector. However, in terms of the power sector in Pakistan, et cetera, the World Bank, JICA, ADB have provided a large amount of power sector reform program loans and can we say that China, and this is related to Africa as well as to Pakistan, by the way, Professor uh, 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 Erica, um, to what extent is Chinese lending coordinated with the policy reforms that are being introduced uh, by the international uh, institutions? Are they part of the conversation? Do they uh, 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 support uh, the, the, the reforms that are, uh, are recommended by these institutions uh, and so forth? Or, are, or, or, or do they see themselves as outside this conversation? In Zambia, they're, um, they're pretty much outside. There is a, a common group uh, that's been coordinated by the World Bank um, about, about donors, it's a donor group, but the Chinese really don't see themselves as donors. And I think the next talk I'm going to give is China is not a donor. <laughs> because it, as you can see from these 15 different lenders, there is really only the CITCA, which is the 
provides the grants and the zero interest loans. They're clearly the donor part of the Chinese government. And then Exim Bank provides the concessional loans, but out of their entire loan portfolio, concessional loans make up 5%. So everything else that, that uh, and then they have preferential export credits, but those aren't considered official development assistance. So everything else is commercial. So really the Chinese are commercial entities and commercial entities are not coordinating in Zambia <laughs> to try to make sure that their lending is sustainable or that it meets with Zambian goals. They're just letting Zambia, Zambian politicians um, call the shots and then they're providing the finance or they have been up until recently. Erika, what about Pakistan? So in the case of Pakistan, when the IMF announced its new package for Pakistan um, in the summer of 2019, they did say in some of their um, documents on, on this package that they regarded China and Saudi Arabia as you know, partners of sorts in um, helping to um, you know, re reduce and restructure Pakistan's um, debt burden. And I think that reflects obviously the amount of the large amount of lending, lending from China, not just, you know, for power sector projects, but for other infrastructure, you know, loans to the Pakistani mini of Ministry of Finance to, you know, help them, help them stay afloat. So I think certainly in the view of the IMF, uh, China was a partner and there's an expectation that China, um, you know, would not um, support any additional projects that would uh, exacerbate Pakistan's debt problem. Um, that said, I don't know to what extent um, different entities in China sort of view themselves as part of this conversation. Um, in Pakistan, as in Zambia, you do have a different, you know, you do have uh, multiple Chinese lenders. It's not just Exim Bank, it's CDB. Um, ICBC is really big in, in lending for CPEC power plants, Bank of China. So you do have some commercial banks in there. Um, and then the other thing I was at is that for Pakistan, I think the government of Pakistan also views the power sector projects um, as, you know, as, as private sector projects. And I think that's one of the reasons why you don't have any um, concessional loans from China, that you just have, you know, regular commercial, um, you know, commercial, commercial rate loans. Right. But whether, whether the financing is concessional yeah. or not, one would hope that they would align themselves, these projects would align themselves with the policy mm -hmm. framework, which would be sort of conducive for long-term sustainable growth. Professor okay. Sandberg, any thoughts on this question about the conversation between China and the international lenders in developing policy frameworks in Africa that uh, ensure sustainability, not just financial sustainability, but also environmental sustainability? Um, one of the things that I was emphasizing in my discussion was the need to be forward looking. You know, we, we have seen these problems, they come and go. And uh, there are two really huge gaps. Uh, one is the, uh, the way contracts are designed. You know, the design features of contracts. Uh, sometimes they end up uh, targeting uh, ability to pay on the volume of commodities as opposed to prices. And so, uh, and then all this uh, over collateralization. So, so there's a big issue of the need to design contracts in such a way that countries, uh, uh, in such a way as talk on their ability to pay. Uh, the other is domestic resource mobilization is really key uh, moving forward for these guys to have their house in order. China should play more in the domain of capacity building and helping these countries to be self-reliant. On, um, on ESG uh, governance, um, I, think, I think there is a, there's inertia. I don't think, I don't think it's, it's going to be very easy <laughs> for, for the Chinese to actually uh, depart from kind of a, something that's kind of gone on for a long time. But I really think that it should come up more in the conversations because that, that's, that, that is that related, it's related. The governance and ESG stuff that was related. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're coming towards the end of the session, but let me ask this last question, Yunan. You've had lots of questions on your presentation, which is a compliment mm -hmm. uh, to, to the quality uh, of, of what you said. Uh, I want to marry two questions together. Uh, the first one is from John Masabo, who raises the Conrad John Masabo, I apologize, who raises the uh, uh, point that, look, most railways are loss-making. Um, why should we be surprised 
that the Ethiopian railway is, is loss making. And then there's the other question um, uh, about from, from Alexander Demisi, which says that actually the private sector seems to be using this railway much more, uh, much more now. And therefore, perhaps in the future, what we may see is that the Addis Djibouti line could potentially be a profitable line. How do you respond to both these points? Um, on, on the question of railways being loss making, I, I think he, he asked uh, if there were examples of profit making railways in the world. Uh, the simple answer to that is that if it's a passenger railway, uh, it is probably not a profit making railway. Um, most of the rationale for these railways depend on freight cargo. That's the only way in which you can have sufficient volumes to generate revenue that, that actually makes money. Uh, and Profit-making railways tend to be connected to, uh, to, to mining resources, basically, to large bulk freight. In Ethiopia's case, this was meant to be, um, you know, some of that revenue is meant to come from, from these industrial zones and from the transport of cargo. There is a passenger line as well, but, but the rationale behind this railway was for freight. Uh, in terms of private sector uptake, that has been very low so far. So uh, while I don't have you know, transparent figures on uh, on the volumes that the railway is transporting so far, you, know, you can safely say that the vast majority of where that freight comes from is from imports into the country, not exports out of the country. So, so the uptake from these manufacturing zones and from the private sector is is still, you know, still quite lackluster. Um, and, and some of that, as I said, you know, comes from uh, from, from structural issues around this connection to the railway and simply that for private sector companies, it's not yet a competitive enough option. Um, and so there would need to be wider structural reforms around the, the liberalization of the shipping and logistics uh, state-owned enterprise. So breaking that monopoly um, and making the railway a more attractive option for private sector is, is key, but also you know, this also depends on the growth of the private sector and those manufacturing zones itself. And, and this is a, a, a bigger sort of question mark in the Ethiopian case. Well, thank you very much, uh, Yunan. Um, we've come to the end of the session. Uh, so let me just wrap up by thanking all the presenters and our very uh, distinguished uh, discussant for their comments and for their presentations. It was a very, very rich discussion. I want to thank all those who who, who, who attended this, this conference. Um, there were some superb questions. I'm sure I didn't do justice to all of them, but thank you anyway for, for, for sending them. And I just